yes, we lift his name on high. I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. For truly God has been good to us all the way to the first Sunday in the month of August. God has been good. He's still being good. And he said, if you trust and believe on me, I will carry you through. So whatever is on your mind today, just turn it over to Jesus. Let him work it out. He can handle it. This and that. This, this, and that, that. Whatever it is. Because your arms are too short to box with God. So you may as well turn it over. Let Jesus work it out for you. I'm just excited to be in the house one more time. For he said, if you want to find me, you would find him in the house of prayer. We're in the house of prayer at the beautiful, pleasant, green Missionary Baptist Church in the beautiful city of St. Louis, Missouri. It is my pleasure, my brothers and sisters, to do the call to worship with scripture and a prayer. I grew up on this scripture as a little girl out at Southern Mission, Kenlock, Missouri, and the pastor read it every Sunday. I don't even need the Bible to give it to you because every Sunday he said, when you learn this one, I'll move to another one. <laughs> And it's so true, I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. So young people, take heed. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands, and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation this is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face O Jacob lift up your heads O ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty and battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Host. He is the king of glory. Let us pray. Wherever you are and whoever you are, God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is to that great God that we pray this morning. Our Father and our God, who sits high and looks low. God, we thank you for waking us up this morning, for the activities of our limbs, the blood yet running warm in our veins. Yes. God, we thank you for our place to come to worship. Yes. We thank you for keeping us from the last time we met until today. Yes. Now, God, we ask you to remember the sick, the shut-in and bereaved families everywhere. <laughs> For we know without you we cannot do anything, but with you all things are possible. Yeah. So we bring all of our cares to you, yeah. for you said we could cast all our cares at your feet. So we bring them to you and say, God, give us the strength to understand if you don't answer us today, that you're still working it out for our good. So help us to be patient, help us to be kind, and help us to show more love to our brothers and sisters. Yes. We pray that you bless every church that's open in the name of Jesus yes. Christ. Bless our pastor and everybody that's going to stand and break the word of life today. Give us strength, dear God, and keep us close as our prayer. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray. And the church said, amen, amen, amen and amen. amen.
Come on. Come on. If you know, if you know that the power of the blood is real. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you know that the blood is real, why don't you just praise God? Come on, let's let's spend just a moment praising God's name. Come on, let's take a moment just to give God the praise. If God is all right, you ought to stand on your feet and tell God, thank you. If God has done something for you that you could not do for yourself, you ought to tell God, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It'll never lose its power. It never loses its power. It reaches the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Is there anybody here that knows that the power of God is real? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless God. Brothers and sisters, uh, I think it is in order to give God praise. Come on, let's give God praise. The word of God says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you have been redeemed, I just believe that you can open up your mouth and tell God, thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are blessed, we're blessed. We th we're thankful. I, I know that today looks different from a few weeks ago. Uh, I know that our momentum has been impacted by us uh, going back to being at home, but I just think that God is real, and I know how God will move, and God uh, has moved in the life of the church, and with that being said, uh, we ought to always lift up his name, lift up his name, come on, let's lift up the name of... <laughs> Brothers and sisters, what we want to do at this point is go to John. John, that music sounds good. That music sounds good. Keep on. Let's fade out. Don't just stop. Just fade out. Amen. Amen. So we want to pause for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done what you're doing in the life of Pleasant Green. God, we pray now that someone hear a word from you. Lord God, whether it be by in-person service or whether it uh, is heard through virtual worship, God, we pause now to give you all that we are. Lord, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Let us say amen. Amen, 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 amen. Brothers and sisters, if you would go with me uh, to again... Again, the book of John. The book of John. We're going to look at the first chapter. We're going to look at three verses. Three verses. We're going to look at We're going to look at John 1, 
40 through 42. John 1, verses 40 through 42. I'm reading the New Living Translation. You know, that's my go-to. That's my read of choice. Um, you may be reading from a different rendition, uh, but you will find words similar to this. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and followed Jesus. Let's say together, followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter or rock. Brothers and sisters, just for a moment or two, I would like to use as a subject for uh, this particular text, when the Lord changes your name. When the Lord changes your name. I know we must get our momentum back up, but why don't you tell your neighbor, even if they are across the room, the Lord is going to change your name. Pleasant parishioners, partners of PG, members and friends, our names are an incredibly important part of our identity. We all know that. Our names carry deep personal, cultural, familial, and historical connections. People know us by our names. They also give us a sense of who we are. The communities in which we belong and our place in the world. In the yesteryear, families would sometimes name their children using only initials. I know family members that were named JB, RT, LB. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, I'm reminded of a distant relative whose name was R.T. Simply R.T. Well, one day R.T. went to enlist in the military, but to his dismay, he could not enlist using the name R.T. R.T. They told him that you can't enlist with simply R.T. So the military gave him a name, and that name was Ray Thomas. They changed his name so that he could go further in the enlistment and enrollment process. Brothers and sisters, they told him that you could only go so far with this name, but you can go a little bit further with the name that we give you. 
someone is missing their shout. I'm just telling somebody today that you can only go so far in and with your own name, but in order to go further, in order to go to another phase of life, in order to go to where God has called you to go, you've got to go with the name that God has given you. You've got to change your name. This connects us with our text because the Lord is one who is known to change names. Do you know the Lord will change your name? And when the Lord changes your name, he does something to your life. The Lord is one who has been known to change names. If you don't believe me, look at Abram. You all remember Abram, don't you? His name was Abram, but when the Lord got a hold to him, his name became Abraham because he would be a father of many nations. He didn't leave Abraham by himself, but he even reached out to Sarai. Sarai's name was Sarai, but when the Lord got a hold to her, her name became Sarah because whereas she was barren, when the Lord got a hold to her, she became full of faith. I wish I had some help in here. When the Lord gets a hold to you, the Lord will change your name. And not only will he change your name, but he will change the trajectory of your life. God changes names and he changes trajectories. Jacob's name is Jacob. But because he wrestled with God all night long, the Lord decided that he wanted to change his name because he was one who struggled with God all night long. And when he woke up the next morning, his name was not Jacob, but his name was Israel. Brothers and sisters, all I'm trying to share with you is that God changes names, and when God changes your name, he changes di the direction and trajectory of your life. The Lord is known for changing names. Jesus even when he encountered a couple of his disciples. You all remember the sons of Zebedee, don't you? Sons of Zebedee, James and John, brothers and sisters, he called them the sons of thunder because he recognized something that was in them. Even at my house, I nickname the people I love because there is something I see within them they may not see in themselves. And again, when the Lord changes your name, he changes your trajectory, and he changes the direction of our lives. As a matter of fact, many, in many African religious traditions, in the rites of passage, a name change suggests a transformation in one's character. I'm reminded of one rites of passage. I know many of you would disagree with me uh, within the initiation process of my fraternity. And if you were wondering, it is Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I began my journey named number two because, brothers and sisters, I was the second person on my line. But when I finished the initiation process, my name was changed from number two to Exodus. 
Exodus was symbolic for me, brothers and sisters, because number one, they understood as brothers that the Bible was my moral compass that directed me along this life and along my priestly duties. They understood that the Bible was special to me, so they called me Exodus. Number two, brothers and sisters, because it was uh, uh, the second book of the Bible and I was the second person online, but more importantly, Exodus means something deeper because it means the departure from captivity to the access of freedom. Might I suggest to you today that in the process of life, a name change means the departure from the old way of life, and it is an introduction to a new way of living. You all remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He says that the old man or the outward man is perishing every day, but the new man is continually being restored. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, God has to change your name. And I just stopped through here to tell you that there are some places that you cannot go until you allow God to change your name. Because when God changes your name, he changes your nature. As a matter of fact, a sergeant cannot lead the junior enlisted to ensure the mission is done properly if he's still called private. Y'all not preaching and praying with me today. I'm going to push on to my clothes in just a minute, but we ought to allow God to change us. Bide your time because before we began celebrating the changing of one's name and ultimately the direction of one's life, there are a few things in this particular text uh, that are worth mentioning uh, before uh, that precede a change. There are some things in the text that I notice that precede change. First of all, as we walk through the text, we notice that before any transformation comes to pass, there is a process that must take place. I, I, I want you to know that, brothers and sisters, that before any transformation uh, takes place, there is a process that we must endure. Before any transformation, comes to pass, there is a process that must take place. There are too many of us and too many times that we expect transformation without trial. There are too many churches that preach and teach that you can have growth without going through. There are too many times where we expect increase without intensity. Uh, we expect improvement without enduring the uphill journey. We expect achievement without effort. We expect glory without the glory of the story. And I think it is worth mentioning and considering today, even as we engage our evangelistic duties, because brothers and sisters, just because you share Christ with someone doesn't mean they are going to change immediately. Improvement is not always immediate. Improvement is not always immediate. Uh, let, me, let me say it again. Improvement is not always immediate. 
Just because you introduce someone with a track in your hand and share with them that the Savior heals, that does not automatically embolden them to be a preacher, a deacon, a trustee, or even a believer that walks in integrity. Sometimes transformation takes a process. Improvement is not always immediate. And I, I just believe that some of us here today can reflect on our own lives and testify that it took a while for us to become who we are today. I just believe that there's somebody here in this church today can reflect on where they were and they can praise God for where they are right now. I, I'm preaching. I need just a little bit of help. Somebody can reflect on the fact that it took them a while to come up out of the dance hall. I don't know what your dance hall was. I don't know if it was the Prestige Lounge or Club 54. I don't know if it was the Zodiac Lounge or the Zach Lounge or maybe it was Jen Lynn. But brothers and sisters, somebody can reflect on the fact that it took them a while to come out of that lounge from doing the mashed potato and the twist. Uh, I, I, I guess y'all gonna leave me here by myself. Let me go down the young folks row. Somebody can reflect on the fact that you not quite finished twerking and you're not ready to work for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, sometimes uh, transformation takes a process process. It's a process. I mean, there's someone here who can reflect on the fact that it took them a while, brothers and sisters, to stop twerking for bands and start working for the man that's upstairs. The truth be told that some of us are still here today that have not been fully transformed. You, you know Pastor Letcher got social media. I, I see your post. I see the post that you put up that say I'm a little bit of hood mixed with a little bit of holy. Pray for me. Don't pray. Don't play with me. I see what you're doing, brothers and sisters. All I'm saying is that change and transformation it takes. Y'all, y'all gonna act like y'all ain't hood mixed with holy. I guess it's just me. Transformation takes time. It is not an immediate thing. Although sometimes it is immediate, sometimes it is all of a sudden, but that is not always the case. I said all that to say this. It is not the case in our text. Peter did not immediately change when he met Jesus. I wish I had some help in here. He did not immediately become the rock when he met Jesus. There was a time of transformation that had to take place. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, if we look at our text, we can see within our text that Peter was undone and spiritually unright. Peter would say something off the wall and then he'd say something right on. Peter would say something right on and turn right around and say something off the wall. In other words, brothers and sisters, Peter was not finished growing. I mean, at this juncture in the text, Peter is a premature pipsqueak of an apostle. But if we observe Peter through the process of development, Peter became a powerful apostle before it was over with. 
He became a powerful apostle that was uh, working for the kingdom of God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, it's important to be reminded that many times transformation de demands a development process. Look at the text. Verse 42, Jesus said to Simon, he said, you shall be called Peter. Peter Cephas means rock or stone. This suggests that he was simply Simon right now. But through the process of experiences that he will have encountered, it would mature him into the man of God that God called him to be. In the process, he would become the Apostle Peter. So many times, the church wants to assassinate those who have not yet become. But we've got to give people time. We've got to give people grace and space to allow them to grow into the person that God has called them to be. Therefore, it's important to give people, again, time, space, grace to develop into what God has designed for them. Brothers and sisters, I know... Uh, I'm not all that God intends for me to be. And I know you all can fully identify that. When you got so many people you serve, they is folk gonna point out everything that's wrong with you. But brothers and sisters, when uh, I, I get to that point and place in my life when I experience those incompetencies, when I experience those inadequacies, when I experience those insufficiencies, I'm reminded of the words of Albertina Walker. You all remember Albertina Walker, don't you? When she used to sing, please be patient with me, for God is not through with me yet. When God gets through with me, I shall come forth like pure gold. I am one who when I look at my brokenness and when I look at my faults and when I look at my failures, I can stand before the people of God. I can stand before God on my own. I don't need y'all to stand before God, but I said, Lord, please. Oh, be patient with me. Oh, please remember that God is not through with me yet when he is through with me. I will be what God wants me to be. So I just want to remind us on this short sojourn with the Savior that when you come across someone who is spiritually stuck, stunted, or stranded, pray for them. When you come across somebody who's not doing what they're supposed to do, you ought to just pray for them and give them grace to grow, the opportunity to unfold and evolve. When you come across someone who perhaps is not strong as you think they ought to be, you ought to cover them with prayer. When someone has faltered in their faith, give them a moment to mature. Give them a second to become who God has called them to be. After all, the Apostle Paul reminds us in Galatians 6 and 1, brothers and sisters, and if I could replace brothers and sisters with pleasant parishioners, pleasant parishioners, if one of you is overcome by sin, what Paul is telling the church, he says, you who are spiritual, you who are righteous, you should pray for them and restore them in a spirit of gentleness and meekness. And I like this part where he says, considering your own self, lest you fall 
into those same temptations. See, a lot of folks like to point at you and not re realizing that when you point at somebody, you got three fingers pointing back. Y'all, I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to sit down. We've got to learn how to pray for people who have not made the mark. Understanding that God can not only change their name, he can change their demeanor. Pray for them uh, because after all, you weren't always filled with the Holy Ghost. After all, if you can just reflect on your life, you were not always sanctified. After all, brothers and sisters, we haven't always been saints ourselves. So brothers and sisters, what would behoove us as believers is that we pray for those who are not where they are supposed to be. So then as we hook our hermeneutical hitch to the Holy Handbook. There are a few aspects that I'll evoke for you to consider as we anticipate transformation. Do you anticipate transformation? I hope that you anticipate transformation. First of all, as we take note of the narrative, what we immediately, well, some of us eventually, would identify is the need to be informed we need to be informed. The church needs to be informed. The world needs to be informed of who Jesus is. Secondly, we need to be introduced to Jesus. We need to be informed of who Jesus is. We need to be uh, introduced to Jesus. And the last piece is, brothers and sisters, we need to be embraced and empowered by Jesus. I want y'all to get these points now. First of all, you need to be informed of who Jesus is. There are people who are alive today. I just was thinking, folks, that was born in 2000, they 21 now. In other words, I said all that to say this. There are some people who have grandparents that don't even, that didn't even go to church. There are some people who are unchurched and don't know about church. So brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing with you is, what I'm sharing with you is that there are some people who need to be informed about who Jesus is. There are some people who don't know Jesus. Second, people need to be introduced to Jesus. And then once they are introduced to Jesus, then they can be embraced and empowered by Jesus. Y'all, it's in the text. Walk with me through the text. We see it in the text. Brothers and sisters, first of all, we see in verses 35 uh, through 30, no, 32 through 36, we see that John the Baptist, he informs the world about Jesus. He, he informs us about Jesus. We need to be informed about Jesus. John the Baptist informs us of the Messiah's coming. What's interesting to me that in verse 32, John didn't know who the Messiah was until the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'm sharing with you today uh, that John continued to do the work of the Lord even though he didn't know when the Lord was coming. He didn't know who the Lord was. He didn't know how the Lord was operating, but he still did the work of God. And brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing with you on today is that we need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to discern who Jesus is now. John continues to do the work of Jesus. 
even though he didn't know where Jesus was, who the Lord was, or what God was doing. And I want to caution you today, brothers and sisters, keep on doing the work of God. And sooner or later, the Lord will show up. Man, I'm, I'm by myself today. Keep doing the work of the Lord, and sooner or later, the Lord will show up. John continued to do the work of the Lord, not knowing who or where the Messiah was, but he just kept on working. That's a mighty word for somebody today that you might not know where God is in all of this chaos and all of this confusion, but you just keep on working for God. You may not be able to see him, you may not be able to trace him, but keep on working for God because sooner or later, if you are faithful, the Lord will show up. John was so dedicated and sold out for God that he didn't care about his clothes because what the text says that he wore uh, a suit made out of locusts. He didn't care about creature comforts, but he was so dedicated uh, to informing the world about Jesus Christ that he said, I am a voice who's crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And I think that that ought, to be, that ought to be our ethos, that we ought to cry to the Lord. Some things ought not matter, but one thing that should matter is that we are sharing the gospel with everybody in the world. Brothers and parishioners, partners of PG, it's important for us as a band of baptized believers that we inform uh, and introduce others to Jesus. That's called real witness. Uh, brothers and sisters, that moves us to our uh, next uh, point. We're listening to we, we need to move. Uh, first of all, we must inform. And the second thing is we've got to introduce. Y'all, y'all may, uh, this may not be a big difference to you, but allow me to explain. Brothers and sisters, it's important for us to introduce the world to Jesus Christ. That's called real witness. Lee Williams and the spiritual QCs say it like this. Won't you tell them for me? It says, tell everybody. Tell everybody you see. I, I know the rhythm and the cadence is not like it was two weeks ago, but I'm going to preach anyway. Tell everybody you see. Tell them. Tell the president. Tell Congress. Tell the Senate. Tell everybody you see. Tell the judge. Tell the country that Jesus is alive and well. Brothers and sisters, we ought to stand up and be witnesses for the Lord. Last piece, I, I'm, I'm, I'm closing. It's one thing, again, brothers and sisters, excuse me, I, I'm not finished with the second piece. Allow me to deal with the second piece first. Uh, it, it's one thing to be uh, informed about Jesus, but it is an entirely different thing to be introduced to Jesus. What am I saying? It's one thing to know of the Lord, but it's a whole nother thing to know the Lord. It's one thing to have heard about Jesus, but all oh, brothers and sisters, it's a whole nother thing to know Jesus. In the text, in verse 41 and 42, Andrew, who is Simon's brother, introduces Simon to Jesus. And I just want to pause 
parenthetically and said, thank God for Andrew because if there was no Andrew, there could not have been a Peter. If there was not a Peter, there could not have been a Matthew 16 and 18 where Jesus made the divinely declarative declaration where he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it, brothers and sisters, every now and then, you ought to take time just to thank God for the Andrews in our lives. Every now and then, we need to just thank God for those who introduced Christ to our life. I don't know who Andrew was in your life, but I thank God for a mama that took me to church and introduced me to Jesus. I don't know who Andrew is in your life. It might have been an auntie. It might have been a father. It might have been a grandfather. But I thank God for somebody that took time to introduce me to a Savior that can save the world. Thank God for the Andrews in our lives. It's one thing to know Jesus but it's an altogether different thing to actually know Jesus. You see, to introduce means to acquaint persons with one another personally. It's not like knowing of the President of the United States, but when you know the President of the United States, it's a whole world of difference. It's a whole world of difference to know of and know someone. I'm reminded when I was 12 years old, i just begun preaching as a boy, uh, and at the time, my grandfather was the moderator of the Zion District Association in Collierville, Tennessee, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I remember, brothers and sisters, at that time, a whole lot of preachers knew him, and he knew a whole lot of preachers. But brothers and sisters, I'm reminded of a particular time in my life. It was very impressionable. There was a person by the name of Reverend Gerald Rayburn who was a very respected pastor in the city. And brothers and sisters, my grandfather decided to introduce me to Reverend Gerald Rayburn. I remember, brothers and sisters, uh, I became acquainted with Reverend Rayburn, and this was a pivotal, uh, pivotal moment in my life because, brothers and sisters, uh, it expanded my reach. This would mean if I preached for Reverend Rayburn, I would be on the radio. Uh, if I preach for Reverend Raven, brothers and sisters, it expanded my reach. This was a pivotal time in my life, brothers and sisters, because uh, I knew someone that could help me get to where God desired for me to be. And all I'm saying to you is, brothers and sisters, that it is important for us to get introduced to the right person. It is important for us to get introduced to the right person. And that right person, brothers and sisters, is Jesus. Get introduced to the right person. Do you know him? There are many people who simply are informed about Jesus, but to access certain opportunities and privileges, you must be introduced to the Lord and you must know Jesus Christ. It's one thing to know Jesus as a prophet, but it's another thing to know him as your savior. It's one thing to know him as rabbi, but it's another thing to know him as your Lord. 
It's one thing to know him as a historical figure, but it's a whole nother thing to know him as God. Preacher of yesteryear used to ask the congregation, do you know him? Do y'all remember that? Preacher yesterday, they used to ask the congregation, do you know him? And they would often follow up with another question, and they would say, do you know him? And then they would follow up by saying, ain't he all right? Do you know him? Ain't he all right? Pleasant Green, I want to ask you those same questions. Do you know him? And ain't he all right? They would ask those questions because, brothers and sisters, what that suggested was that if you really knew Jesus, you would have likely experienced some things about Jesus. If you really knew Jesus, you know that he's a hard fixer. If you really knew Jesus, you really have discovered by now that he is a mind regulator. If you knew him by now, you would know that uh, he is a company keeper. If you really knew the Lord, you know that he was a burden bearer and a heavy load sharer. If you really know the Lord, you would know that he's not only a lawyer in a courtroom, but he's a case dismisser. He's a support enlister and a mighty assister. If you really knew the Lord, you know that God is able uh, to do all things abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I'm done today, but I'm so glad that Andrew shared with Peter who Jesus was. Witness is important because had not Andrew shared with Simon his knowledge of the Messiah with his brother. There would not have been the awesome contributions that the apostle Peter made to the church. If Andrew had not introduced Peter to the Lord, the 3,000 folks that were affected only by the shadow of Peter would not have been saved. I'm going to my seat now. I thank God for being informed. I thank God for being introduced. But I thank God the most that Jesus embraced and empowered me. Jesus recognized that Peter was a half-hearted follower. There are those in the church today that still haven't gotten to the place where God has called you to be. There are some folks here who are half-hearted followers. Brothers and sisters, and those half-hearted followers needed a personal touch from the Lord. There's someone here today that needs an embrace of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus embraces you, 
what I'm sharing with you, he will turn a misfit into a masterpiece. Jesus gave Peter this new name, the rock, because the Lord knew that Peter would eventually grow into this name. The text says in verse 42 that Jesus looked at Peter. The translation here means that he looked right through Peter. What this means is that God could see everything about Peter. Is there anybody who's ever had someone to look right through you? Is there anybody, in other words, has there anybody had a parent to look at you and look right through you? Know what you're thinking? Know how you're feeling? We know that the Lord, as our divine parent, can look at us and look right through you. And amazingly, brothers and sisters, the Lord was able to look at Peter, saw his past, saw his present, and was able to see his future. Saw what he'd been through. Saw what he's going through. Saw what he would go through. But still, and trust him with building the church on the truth that Peter shared. Brothers and sisters, one other encouraging piece is that when God looks at you, he not only sees through you, but he sees all that is within you. The Lord looks at you the same way he looked at Peter. Pleasant Green, Pleasant Parishioners, Partners of PG, God looks at you. And he not only sees you, but he sees your potential. He sees all that you can become. Brothers and sisters, we don't see what God sees. We see a lump of clay. But God sees a finished product. We see a lump of clay, but God sees a beautiful vase. We see a blank canvas, Lauren, but God sees a masterpiece. We see a lump of coal, but God sees a refined diamond. We see problems, but God sees potential and possibilities. We see perplexity, but God sees solutions. We see failures, but God sees success. We see Jacob, but God saw Israel. We see Simon, but God saw an apostle Peter. We see an old rugged cross, but thank God, before he sent Jesus to die on Golgotha's hill, he saw an empty tomb. And it was only after Simon's encounter with Jesus at Caesarea Philippi that anyone referred to Peter as Simon as Peter. Brothers and sisters, allow God to change your name. And when God changes your name, he changes the direction of your life. The trajectory of your spiritual walk. Allow the Lord to change your name. The door of the church is open. The door of the church. through 
Again, brothers and sisters, the door of the church is open. Uh, that is not only a call for you to be introduced and informed and embraced by Jesus Christ, but this is also a call to discipleship. This is a call for discipleship. There is someone who is in the church who has been informed about Jesus, and introduced to Jesus, but take the next step and be embraced by Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is a call for discipleship. We need you to serve on all ministries of the church so that the church can continue to grow and the church can be effective in the community around us. Brothers and sisters, think on this and think on your eternality. We bless God for you. Come on, let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. Brothers and sisters, at this time we want to get ready to uh, fellowship in the Eucharist or what we call the communion. Uh, the Last Supper, the celebration of the Last Supper, the communion. We want to pause for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for putting people in place to inform us about you. We thank you for Sunday school classes on Saturday and Sunday. We thank you for Bible study. We thank you for every opportunity to be informed about Jesus Christ. God, we also are thankful for those intimate opportunities to be introduced to you. Lord God, help us in the privacy of our own prayer ground to become closer to you so that we may know you better. Then God, we pray that after we are informed about you and introduced to you, Lord God, embrace us. And God, not only change our name, change the trajectory of our lives. And God, we ask that not only that you embrace us, but empower us to do ministry as you have called us to do. Bless Pleasant Green. Lord God, as we engage in the celebration of the Eucharist and Lord God, the fellowship of communion, Lord God, let us engage in this practice uh, Lord God, in a worthy manner. Lord God, we ask that we do it worthily. We know we are not worthy, but allow us to do it worthily. In other words, let us put aside those sins that may easily beset us. God, we ask you for forgiveness so that we can engage in remembering your bleeding and your suffering and your dying. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.
Sing today, sing today. and sisters, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, 24th verse, it says, and he gave thanks to God, then he broke bread in pieces, saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and God's people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. And he tells the church, pleasant parishioners, and the church universal, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, let's commune together. He died upon the cross, and I know well the blood for me to celebrate again the faithfulness of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Please let everyone know that we are back in in-person worship. Let everyone know that we are in back in in-person worship. We are recognizing all of the CDC guidelines. And brothers and sisters, we want you to come and be in worship with us and we thank God for your faithfulness. Uh, we want to also just salute one of our members who has been wearing many hats, been wearing many hats. We bless God for uh, Sister Quincy Humphrey for her faithfulness. Just stand up if you will. Just let me, the word of God says, let me give you the flowers. So we want to salute you. Uh, we salute her and her faithfulness. I started to post a picture. I ain't get her permission. Uh, I started to post a picture on Facebook. She, 
was at a funeral. She had her nurse's outfit on. She was singing in the choir, and she was checking folks in. We just bless God for her faithfulness. And she uh, uh, deals with our Christian education every Saturday. For that, we are thankful for you. We are thankful for your faithfulness. Amen. And also, we, uh, that is a call to service. Uh, for those of us uh, who are pleasant parishioners, those who are involved in the church, we need you. We need you uh, to help uh, with uh, checking in on Sunday mornings. We need you. Uh, one person cannot do it all. So we're calling you. We're calling you, brothers and sisters. The Word of God says that, uh, that the work is plenteous. Uh, but the workers are few. So therefore, brothers and sisters, we're calling you to help out uh, with our, uh, in the uh, mornings, our check-in, uh, to get our temperatures taken, uh, and to direct people into the house of God. We need you. We need someone to help relieve the people who always do it every Sunday. So we thank, we thank those who are faithful in their commitment uh, to the church. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Brothers and sisters, also we're thankful for all of those who are committed to giving. We're thankful for those who are committed to giving. Proverbs 3 and 9 says, honor the Lord uh, with your wealth and the first fruits of your income. And brothers and sisters, there are a few ways you can do that. Uh, if you have not been doing it, we want to challenge you uh, to do so. Uh, and be committed in your financial stewardship. Uh, the way you can do that, brothers and sisters, uh, is that you can send a check or a money order. If perhaps you didn't bring anything today, you can bring a check or a, uh, you can send a check or a money order by mail. You can send a check or a money order by mail uh, to uh, the physical campus of this church, and that is 1220, 1220 R.E.V. G.H. Pruitt Place, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. Please send the check or money order. We don't want your cash to get lost in the mail. Send the check, because sometimes that cash don't come back, amen. It may go to the wrong address, and we just want uh, your gift to get to its intended target, amen? You can send a check or a money order to 1220 REVGH Pruitt Place, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113, or you can give by electronically. You can give electronically, and that way you can uh, log on to our website at www.pgmbc stl.org. You can give electronically at www.pgmbcstl.org. You can click on our giving tab. Once you click on the giving tab, uh, uh, you can then give electronically. We thank you for your blessings. And also, brothers and sisters, uh, if you perhaps brought a gift that you would like to give today, uh, we are not dismissing you or neglecting you. We have three drop boxes available uh, that when you leave the church building, you can either submit them into two, two drop boxes in the back of the church or you can submit your gift uh, to uh, uh, at the side of the church in this drop box. Amen? Amen. We're blessed for you. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for your patience with our ministry as God has called us to grow. With that being said, brothers and sisters, let's prepare for dismissal. Everybody say, everybody say, everybody say.
everybody say Let the meaning say Let the meaning say Let the meaning say Sound pretty good Tablet down and say amen right quick. Let the children say amen. But this is the best one. Let the church say. to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forever pleasant parishioners let us all say Go in peace, go in peace until next time.